This man, Tommy Teese, has made a career out of picking up the leftovers from the main muster. In less than a season, he and his offsider have brought in 1,500 prime head, which managed to evade the horsemen and the choppers on VRD. the most dangerous of all activities on a cattle station. When a two-ton bull turns on you, the only protection is a two-inch bull bar, and that's not much protection when you find out that bulls have been known to jump right up into the cabin. But for Tommy Teese, driving his four-wheel drive at breakneck speed across open country is excitement unlimited. Each bull catcher has his own techniques of angering the bull into making a mistake. During this encounter, in ramming the Toyota, the bull put his horn straight through the steel guards with very little effort. The bull has to be brought down without being bruised in any way, or his value at the market suffers badly. In less than half an hour, they have downed 11 bulls, but then that's the easy part. It will take them four times as long to get the bulls on board the truck and prepare them to be shipped back to the yards and eventually to the cattle market. In the space of just three hours, they have more than $4,000 worth of cargo on board. Not bad for a morning's work. Those early pioneers who opened up this vast outback of Australia deserve to be revered. With the modern communications and transport of today, it's hard to imagine life as it was when this land was really isolated and hostile. Aircraft certainly made a difference. Like radio telephones, they reduced the size of the country, bringing the cities within easy reach of the people of the outback. They have aided in the development of the inland, bringing in the mail and urgently needed supplies, and have assisted the station owners in developing new markets. Yet the early pioneers didn't have these benefits. When they started westward, they committed themselves to lives of almost total isolation. The risks they took to venture into this remote inland were great. For some of the lucky ones, those risks paid off handsomely. They were celebrated as the cattle kings. Their families made fortunes and retired to the comfort of the big cities to live a life of luxury and Victorian opulence. For others who were not so lucky, it meant a life struggling against the isolation and all the worst conditions nature could provide. Those poor souls scratched for a living till their dying day, only to be buried in a rough wooden coffin beside their tumble down homesteads. Droughts, floods, bushfires, disease, all possibly in the one year. Through their perseverance, the wild outback of Australia was eventually tamed. The first settlers needed hundreds of pack animals which could withstand the rigours and extremes of the inland climate. They brought with them camels and donkeys and horses to transport their goods across the top end. Eventually, 
Afghan traders began carrying goods from the coastal settlements to the inland stations by camel train. Being no longer useful and having served their purpose, many of these camels, donkeys and horses were set free in the bush. Offspring of what was once a handful of useful animals now number hundreds of thousands. Today, like the kangaroo and other native animals, they compete with station cattle for the limited amount of available feed. When Victoria River Downs changed hands in 1960, a shootout of donkeys and wild horses was undertaken. 60,000 Brumby horses and 40,000 donkeys were shot in a two-year period without seriously reducing their number. Today, they are still in plague proportions. But there is another, potentially more serious problem arising from the presence of these animals. Donkeys, horses and even the cattle themselves are hard-hoofed animals, intruders into the Australian outback where the native animals are soft-pawed. Even when cattle were in far smaller numbers, the droving tracks toward the end of the season were nothing more than powdery dust. This erosion was caused solely by the tramping of hard-hoofed animals on the brittle volcanic soil. When the winds came and scattered the surface dust, the droving tracks were etched deeply into the earth, leaving crevices which would run as rivers in the wet. With the winds dispersing the fertile topsoil, the grasses that once grew on the vast ranges of these cattle stations are getting less and less, while the number of animals to feed continues to grow. A great deal of research has been done on soil erosion at the research station at Kidman Springs. To date, nothing practical has been released as an overall solution to this disastrous problem. Unfortunately, while the seriousness of the situation is recognised by most graziers, there is little they can do to overcome it and still continue to operate. Modern technology cannot escape its share of the blame for antagonising the problem. Road trains and heavy duty earth moving equipment tear up the dirt tracks as they race from location to location. And helicopters, as they work low to the ground, hovering just above the cattle, upset and disperse the loose topsoil in clouds of dust. Yet the impact on the land must be balanced against the benefits that are derived and have been derived over the years. The problems that are becoming evident now would never have been foreseen by the cattle kings of a century ago. Their primary intention was not to destroy the land, nor to be written into history, but merely to survive in this land that everyone told them was worthless and uninhabitable. It's strange, because that is still the intention shared by those who rank amongst today's cattle kings.